أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب إشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأهل العقدة من لسان يفكه قولي الحمد لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين أما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى في كتابه المجيد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سلام على آل ياسين آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات على محمد وآل محمد Your second salawat for love of the Ahlul Bayt alayhim as And your loudest of salawat for ta'jeel of Imam Zaman Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad Respected elders, brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh our discussion tonight is our eighth Imam and learning about our eighth Imam. In the Quran, we see where Allah says, Allah commands His to say, "Qul la as'alukum alayhi ajran illa al-mawaddata fil qurba." Say, when the people came to the Holy Prophet, as they came to the other Anbiya. So, whenever a Prophet from Allah would come to the people. And the people would follow the message of the Prophet. They would come to the Prophet and say, You saved us from the hellfire. You taught us how to get to Allah. We want to reward you for teaching us this. You taught us how to love Allah, how to be close to Allah, how to worship Allah. So we want to reward you. So every Prophet before Rasulullah, he said, I don't want any reward from you. Certainly my reward is with Allah. However, when they came to our Holy Prophet, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Allah commanded our Prophet to say, Qul, say, La as'alukum alayhi ajran. I don't want any reward from you. Illa al-mawaddata fil qurba. Except mawaddat for my close ones, for my family. Now, in the Arabic language, there are a lot of words for love. There's hope, there's many words. But mawaddat is a very specific word. Mawaddat specifically refers to a crazy kind of love. Like when you love someone like crazy, like you love them more than you love anyone or anything else. Like you know sometimes, for example, you say I love chicken nuggets. I could eat chicken nuggets every meal of the day, breakfast, lunch and dinner. I would never get tired of eating. Mawaddat is more love than that love. So they give an example. They say, a fish, when you eat it, you become thirsty for water because the fish in your stomach loves water that much. They say, that's the kind of love that Rasulullah was talking about that you should have for the Ahlul Bayt. Now, you and I, when we think about someone we love in our lives, for example, we think about our mom, we think about our dad, we think about, for example, sometimes we love our teachers. We love our friends. There's generally two reasons we love someone. We love someone because either they're special to us and we love them so therefore we try to be like them. Like you love your dad. So you try to be like your dad and you, when you try to be like your dad, you, it's because you love him. Then there are other people, for example, our teachers, who because they teach us something, we love them. We love them because this is a person who took the time to teach me, they pay attention to me, they listen to me, they try to help me. When it comes to loving the Ahlul Bayt, they are the intersection perfectly between both of these characteristics. We love them, therefore we try to emulate them. And they teach us, therefore we love them as well. So when we want to have this love and have a deep love for the Ahlul Bayt, we have to look at their lifestyles and learn what they're trying to teach us. Learn the lessons that they're trying to teach us and then try to behave like them as well too. Otherwise that love doesn't mean anything. The same way, for example, if I say I love you and I keep punching you. Oh, I love you so much and I keep punching you. Oh, I love you so much and I keep punching you. Would you believe I love you? 
No, you would say that no. Your actions are showing me you don't love me even though your words are telling me you love me. So the same way, for example, when we love our Imam, if we don't know what he likes and what he doesn't like, and we keep doing things our Imam doesn't like, and we say, I love my Imam, I love my Imam, will our Imam believe us that we love him? No. He'll say, no, you may say you love me, but you're acting like you don't love me. So it makes it very important for us to learn about who they were as people, what their lives were like, what were the things that they liked, and what were the things they didn't like. When I say I love my Imam, what do I need to behave like? So when we bring our, our discussion to the point then of understanding our Imams in such a way that, okay, if I say I love him, I should know about him. The same way if I say I love the Knicks, I know who the players on the Knicks are, I know how many games they won, I know who they're going to be playing next, and I know all of this information about them. That's just a team. Today I like them, maybe tomorrow I won't. Maybe tomorrow I'll become a Nets fan because the Nets now are in Brooklyn and that's kind of nice. And all of that will go to waste. But when it comes to the Ahlul Bayt and the Imams, you're going to love them from the day you're a little kid until you're an old man. So is it more important you should know about the Nets and the Knicks or more important you know about Rasulullah and the family of Rasulullah? So you have to invest time. You have to read. You have to pay attention. You have to learn about them. So we have to take that time. Now, when we turn and we start our conversation about our eighth imam, who is Imam Ali ibn Musa al-Radha alayhi salam, salli ala Muhammad wa We see his title is al-Radha, the one who is pleasing or acceptable or the one who everyone is happy with. So someone one day came to the Imam's son and said to him, we heard that your father's title was ar radha the one with whom people are pleased. We've heard that he was given this title because Ma'mun, the Khalifa of the time, was pleased with him. Imam Jawad, the son of Imam Radha, said, no, that's not true. That's not the reason why he was given the title of ar radha He was given the title of ar radha the one who is pleasing, is because Allah was pleased with him. Rasulullah was pleased with him, and all of the Imams were pleased with him, therefore he was known as ar radha So this companion, he turns to Imam Jawad, he says, but Imam Jawad, aren't all of the Imams pleasing to Allah? Aren't all of the Imams pleasing to the Holy Prophet? And Imam Jawad replies, he says, that's very true, but Imam Radha had this unique quality that not only did the friends of Allah love Imam Radha, but even the enemies of Allah used to love Imam Radha. He says, that's why the title of Radha became exclusive for my father, because there was no one who was unpleased with him or displeased with him. Even his enemies used to love him. So this personality was a very amazing Imam for us, and we learned a lot of lessons from him. First off, we see that my Imam's life is approximately 35 years before he becomes an Imam. So, Imam Radha becomes an Imam at the age of 35. However, even this was not an easy time period for him, even though he wasn't the Imam. We his, see his father, Imam Musa ibn Ja'far al-Kadhim alayhi salam. Muhammad wa He was in prison for a period of 14 years or maybe even more than that. So Imam, Imam Radha was separated from his father when he was still about 20 years old. And Imam Radha happened to have many brothers and sisters. Imam Radha had a total of 36 brothers and sisters. And mashallah, there were many family members and he had many supports. But because his father was in prison, Imam Radha had to take a lot of the responsibilities on to help the mu'mineen in the world. And we see that my Imam, he lived in the city of Medina for most of his life. He lived in the city of Medina for approximately 52 years. At the age of 52, Imam Radha, after being the Imam for 17 years, Imam Radha is forced by the king of the time to move to Tus, to move to a city in Iran, Khurasan as it was known at the time. At that age, what was happening was that the Khalifa of the time was having a fight with his brother. And when he was having a fight with his brother, his brother was all Arab and Ma'mun, the Khalifa, was not all Arab. 
So he killed his brother. When he killed his brother, Ma'mun kills his brother. The Arabs become unhappy with him. So he says, all of the Arabs love the family of the Prophet and the children of the Prophet. So I'm going to make Ali ibn Musa Rida come and move to Iran and be my helper. So that way people in the Arab lands will accept me as well too. And we see that the last three years of the Imam's life were spent in the city of Tus or in Khurasan. Mashhad is where he was buried. Tus is where he lived. Mashhad is where he was buried afterwards. He was moved to be buried at that time. Because Ma'mun insisted that Imam Rada be buried next to Harun, his father. So he moved him to the gravesite of Harun and tried to bury him there. But there's a lot of lessons we learn in this time period. First off, we see that the last three years of Imam Rada's life are the t is the time that we know the most about. Because during that time, he became the successor to the Khalifa. When he became the successor to the Khalifa, all of the people in the Muslim world would come to see him and spend time with him. But before we get to that conversation, we take a look at the life and we see that Imam Rada, when he lived in the city of Medina, was a teacher. He would spend his time in the mornings, in the days, and at night, teaching all of the people that were there about Islam. And he would be a, one of the best teachers in that area and make sure that anyone who had a question about Islam, he would go and Imam Rada would be able to answer it and to educate the people and he taught classes. Then we see one interesting point. Imam Rada was one of 37 children. He had 36 brothers and sisters. Who knows how many children Imam Rada had? One. Imam Rada had only one child. Who knows how old Imam Rada was when he had his child? Imam Rada passes away, becomes Shaheed at the age of 55. When he becomes Shaheed, his son is either seven or eight years old. Forty-seven, that's right. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Sallu ala Muhammad. So meaning Imam Rada had no children for 47 years of his life. When you and I, we think about, for example, the difficulties of life, one of the difficulties of life, Allah Himself is saying, uh, that the tests in life and the trials in life are your children and your wealth. That for a man not to have any children until the age of 47 or 48, when the rest of his siblings have many children and his father had many children, imagine how the people treated him. Imagine how the people, people used to bother him, Imam Rada, that, oh, you have no children, you have no support. It was a very difficult thing, and we have to understand that with the same way when we take a look at an Imam, we see certain lessons that we learn from his life and his teachings. It doesn't mean that the Imam didn't have difficulties in his life as well, too, or the Imam wasn't tried and put through difficulties. Allah says in the Quran, nasu an yutraku an yakunu amanna wa hum la yiftanun. Do you think that you will say you keep faith and you won't be tested? The same way we talk about tests in life that you and I face, sometimes the test in our life is the difficulties we have in our families, sometimes with our siblings, with our parents, with our schools, with where do we get money from. These are challenges that we have in life. The test is, is when you are put through these trials, do you still keep your faith? Do you still act like a Muslim? Do you still act like a way that would be appropriate for a moment to behave? Trials of Imam Rada. In the beginning, of, in the earlier years of his life, his father is taken away from him. We ever read and we see that Imam Rada behaved in a bad way because his father was taken away from him? Do we ever read that Imam Rada wasn't a good person because his father wasn't with him? No, because the responsibility of a Muslim is, is no matter how Allah tests you and gives you difficulties in your life, you still continue to do the right things and you do the good things. So the same way we see Imam Rada, he wanted kids too. He wanted to have children too, but Allah didn't bless him with children until a very late age. But how did Imam Rada behave? Did we ever read in books that Imam Rada was a mean person or he wasn't happy or he used to be very angry or he used to say, why God, why me? No, we never hear any of these things because Imam Rada is demonstrating and teaching us that no matter what your difficulties in life are, you have to be a good mu'min and you have to act with faith. Because Allah is testing you. I'm He's telling you, I'm going to test you. And when I test you, I want to see if you really have faith or not. The same way, we can say, I love Allah, I love Allah. Allah gives you a brand new Mercedes. Are you going to love Allah? Yeah, of course. If I give you a new Mercedes, you're going to love me, right? 
I'm not giving you a new Mercedes. That's easier to love Allah when good things are happening to you, when Allah is giving you what you want. But sometimes it happens that Allah is going to test you, and then He wants to see, do you still really love me or not? Do you still really love me when you don't get the new Mercedes? Do you still really love me when you have no car? Do you still really love me when you don't have kids? Do you still, still really love me when there are other problems in your lives? That's the test. That's why when we look at the Imams and we learn about their lives, we realize, wow, I thought my life was hard, but look how difficult the life of the Imam was, and he loved Allah so much. I should love Allah too if I want to love my Imam and be like my Imam. So we take a look and we see the life of Imam Radha that the next phase after, for example, at the age of approximately 52, the Khalifa of the time insists and he says, Imam Radha, you have to leave Medina and you have to come to Iran. And you have to come to the city that was known as Tus in that time. Support the government. Imam Radha says, no thanks, I'm okay. The governor, the king says at that time, he says, you have to come or else. So Imam Radha says, okay, fine, I'll come. When Imam Radha comes, the king says, okay, I want you to be the Khalifa of the time. You're the Khalifa. Imam Radha says, I don't want to be the Khalifa. The Khalifa is a usurped position. If I become the Khalifa, it will say that you legitimately were a Khalifa and you had the right to give me this position. Mamun, who was the Khalifa of the time, he says, no, no, you have to be the Khalifa. I'm telling you to be the Khalifa. Imam Radha says, you can't make me the Khalifa. I don't want to be the Khalifa. He says, why not? He says, because the Khilafat isn't yours to give. He says, if Allah made you the Khalifa, then you can't give it to me because Allah made you the Khalifa and that's yours. You can't make me the Khalifa. And if Allah didn't make you the Khalifa and you stole the Khilafat from somebody else, it's not yours to give to me anyway. So he says, therefore, I refuse to be the Khalifa. Mamun says, okay, fine. If you don't want to be the Khalifa, then you'll become my successor. Imam Rada says, I don't want to be your successor. I don't want anything to do with your government. Your government is not a legitimate government. Mamun says, either you take this position of authority or I will kill you. So Imam Rada says, you have threatened my life now. You haven't left me an option. That I have no choice except to accept this position of being the successor to the Khalifa. This is how we see Imam Rada when he is threatened, his life is threatened. He enters into the position of government. And this is a very interesting point, because the point in working with the government is something that the Ahlul Bayt used to teach about. When we take a look at the father of Imam Radha, Imam Musa ibn Ja'far al-Kadhim alayhi salam, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. He had a friend, the seventh Imam had a friend named Safwan. Safwan was known as Safwan al-Jammal. Safwan, the, the camel owner. In that time, when you wanted to do business or go on a journey, there were no cars, so you couldn't go to Enterprise and rent a car. You couldn't go to, you know, budget and rent a truck. You would rent camels. And Safwan used to rent people his camels. But he was a, he was a Shia. He used to love Imam Musa ibn Ja'far. One day, he comes to sit with our seventh Imam, Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, and when he sits down with him, Imam Musa ibn Ja'far says, Oh, Safwan, everything you do is fantastic except one thing. You do all of the good things a Shia should do except for one thing, Safwan. You do one thing a good Shia shouldn't do. Safwan becomes really astounded. He says, Ya ibn Rasulullah, O grandson of the Prophet, what is that one thing that I do? I'll stop it right now. Imam Musa ibn Jafar says, he says, Safwan, you rent your camels to Harun. And Harun has usurped our authority and he has taken away our position as the leader of the Muslimin. You should not support him. Safwan replies, but pro oh, grandson of the Prophet, Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, I rent him my camels just so that he can go to Hajj. I don't rent him so he can do bad things with them, so that he can go to Hajj. And I don't take him myself that I'm helping him and he's a usurper. No, I send people to go with him. I never go with him myself. Imam Musa ibn Ja'far says, Safwan, tell me something. When Harun takes your camels away and he goes to Hajj, do you hope that Harun stays alive so that he can come back and return your property to you? Do you hope that Harun comes back and pays you the rent for, his cam for your camels that he took from you? Safwan said, yeah, I, I do. I want my camels back. I, I want to get paid for my camels. Imam Musa ibn Jafar explains, he says, Safwan, 
for our mu'min to ever hope for a mu moment that a usurper, a zalim, stays alive is as if he's helping the zalim. Our mu'mineen should have no association with the unjust rulers and authority. So now you take a look and you see that the seventh imam is teaching us, he says, have no relationship with an unjust government. Don't even rent your camels, okay? So none of you should rent your camels to an unjust government. He's teaching you, he's telling you, no association with the government that you hope an illegitimate government that stole the rights of the Ahlul Bayt stays in power. Not even for a moment. Yet we take a look and we see his son, Imam Ali al-Radha, he actually becomes the successor to the king of the government. But there's a difference between these two points. Safwan had no problem. Safwan had the choice that if he wants to rent his camels, he can rent his camels. If he doesn't want to rent his camels, he doesn't have to rent his camels. Imam Radha winds up in a position where if he doesn't work with the government, the governor, the king of that time will kill Imam Radha. So he's teaching you that when it comes to relationships with the government, if you have freedom and there's no problem, stay away from the government as long as you can. Don't support the government. Don't be a friend of a government that has stolen our right, that stole the right of the Ahlul Bayt. But if your life becomes in danger the way Imam Radha's life became in danger, it's okay for you to work with the government under the condition. Look at the condition our eighth Imam sets. He sets the condition. He says, fine, I will be your successor in this government, but I will not appoint or remove any of the lawmakers, and I will have nothing to do with the making of laws. I will stay away from all affairs of the government. However, fine, if you want to name me the successor, I'll be the successor to your government. In this way, Imam Radha becomes the successor to the Khalifa Ma'moon of his time. Ma'moon, now think about it. If I stole the governor and the authority of the Imam, why would I want the Imam to be my successor? Ma'moon thought he was very smart. Ma'moon says, you know, when I look back at my father Harun, and I look back at all of the other Khalifas who took the right of the Ahlul Bayt and took the Imamat from the Ahlul Bayt, they all abused the Imams and they all wound up in very bad conditions. He says, look at Yazid Mal'un. Yazid attacked Imam Hussein and then was killed and he died immediately after that. You take a look at all of the children of the Banu Umayyah, because they would fight with the children of Imam Ali and Bibi Fatima, they would wind up dead and they would wind up bad and people would hate them. He says, even my father used to fight with Imam Sadiq and therefore we saw that my father had a miserable life as well too. He says, I'm going to take a different approach. I'm going to make this Imam Ali al radha my friend, and I'm going to try and use him to make me look good. Where everybody else would try and suppress the Imams and they lost, I'll try to make him my best friend and I'll keep him with me. And therefore, I'll be successful. Where all of the other Khalifas failed, I'll be successful. That was his plan, that I'm going to make Imam Radha stay with me, then people will like me because I'm friends with him, and then the people will support my government and I'll be the king for a very, very long time. This was his plan. However, when Imam Radha came to the city of Tus and he came to live in that area of Khurasan, he started to realize something. Amun said, whenever I sit next to Ali al radha they love him more than they love me. They see him and he's so perfect and so excellent. They wonder to themselves, why is Mamun our king when Ali al radha is here? She says, people, they started hating me because they would look at me and say, why is this loser our king when Imam Ali al radha is so perfect and so amazing and so excellent? So Mamun says, I have to make Ali al radha look bad. I have to make him look like he's a normal person because right now he looks like he's perfect and he's excellent. So Ma'moon begins this process of debating with the eighth Imam and showing and trying to test the knowledge of the eighth Imam to see where does the eighth Imam make mistakes, to show in some way that someone is smarter than the eighth Imam. So he brings the philosophers from Greece, he brings the atheists from Iran. He brings the Christians of the best quality from, from the Coptics. He brings the Jews. And he makes Imam Radha debate with these people constantly that in some way someone should show that Imam Radha is not perfect and he can make a mistake. However, Imam Radha being the amazing personality that he is, Imam Radha never makes a mistake in any of these debates. 
And then Ma'mun himself starts to challenge Imam Radha and he asks him questions where he would call Imam Radha in the middle of the night. And when he would call him in the middle of the night, he would start questioning him in the middle of the night to see does Imam Radha make any mistakes. And one lengthy conversation that he has with Imam Radha is he says, prove to me why you Ahlul Bayt, you the children of Fatima, deserve to have authority instead of us, the children of the uncle of the Holy Prophet. So Mamun, he was from the children of Banu Abbas. Hazrat Abbas happened to be the uncle of the Holy Prophet. So since he was the children of the uncle of the Holy Prophet, and Imam Radha is the son of the daughter of the Holy Prophet, these two were cousins. So Mamun would say, cousin, why should you be the leader according to Islam and not me and I'm your cousin? So Imam Radha begins a long debate and gives him many answers. In that he says, tell me something Mamun. did you read the Quran? He says, yes I've read the Quran. Have you ever seen the Quran where it says, Salamun ala Nuhin fil alameen, Salamun ala Ibrahim. He says, yes I saw this. He says, do you agree that in the Quran that Allah sends Salam on the various Anbiya? Especially in Surah Safat from verse 89 or so, begins the conversation where Allah is saying salam on the various prophets. He says, yes, I've read this. This is very true. He says, tell me something. In the Quran, there is a surah named Yasin. Who is it talking about when Allah says Yasin in the Quran? Mamun says, it's only talking about Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Imam Radha says, are you sure? Are you certain? He says, yes, definitely. When someone says, when Allah says Yasin in the Quran, it can only be talking about the Holy Prophet. So Imam Radha says, he says, there Ma'moon, you understand that while Allah sends Salam on the Anbiya in the Quran, the only people who are not Anbiya that Allah sends Salam to in the Quran are us, the family of the Prophet, the children of the Prophet. Mamun says, no way, prove to me where. Imam Radha says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Salamun ala Ali Yaseen, which is verse number 130 of Surah Safat. Now, contemporarily, when we read this surah and you look at verse number 130 where it says, Salamun ala Ali Yaseen, the way we read it currently is it's pronounced Salamun ala Il Yaseen. Ilyasin and Ali Yasin is the difference of where we put the dash. Do we put it as a fatha or do we put it as a kisra? Now, there are seven correct recitations of the Quran contemporarily. The current recitation that is famous during our time is one of those recitations, the recitation of Hafs, in which it's pronounced Ilyasin. Of these seven recitations, at least two of them pronounce this ayah Salamun ala Ali Yasin. The other five, they pronounce it as Ilyasin. So we see that in amongst the seven recitations, Ali Yasin is correct and Ilyasin is considered correct and appropriate. We see that the Ahlul Bayt taught us to recite it in both ways. When you take a look at some of the well-known translators and Mufassirin, they say that this verse is saying, Salam on the Prophet Ilyas. However, when you take a look at that Qur'an and you take a look at how it's written, it's not written as the name Ilyas. The name Ilyas is written very differently. This is written as Salamun ala Alif Lam and then Yasin. So it's not referring to Nabi Ilyas. So anyone who tells you this is talking about Nabi Ilyas hasn't read and looked at the actual Arabic within the Qur'an to determine that this isn't how you write the name Ilyas. So the pronunciation Ilyas became famous among some people. However, the correct pronunciation of this we know as a fact to be Salamun ala Ali Yaseen. So Imam Radha is teaching, he says, we have the status above all other people because Allah Himself sends Salam on us in the Quran and He doesn't send Salam on anyone other than the Anbiya and us, the Ahlul Bayt alayhim as salam. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. In this way, we see that Imam Radha, he spent a lot of his time teaching and educating and he was a great supporter and a helper to the people of the Mu'mineen and the people of the time. And he answered many of the questions and the issues and he taught people how they should behave. 
when he debates, for example, with the Jews, he says to them, he says, why do you accept the book of Musa? Why do you believe Musa was a Nabi? He says, well, because Musa is a prophet, he separate, he split the Red Sea, he had the hand that would glow, he had the staff that would turn into a snake, and he performed many miracles. <coughs> Therefore, we become certain of the Nabuat of Nabi Musa. Imam Rada says, did you see these acts yourself? He says, no, but we read them in a book. So Imam Rada says, then why do you refuse to believe the Nabuat of my grandfather, the Holy Prophet? He says, we weren't there. We never saw those actions either. He says, but it's okay for you to believe the miracles of Musa, who you never saw but read in books, but not believe in the miracles of the Holy Prophet, who you never saw but you read in books. He says, therefore, your logic is flawed, that if another one can come and present the same miracles or better, he should be the Prophet as well too. And therefore, I prove to you that my grandfather was the one who performed these great miracles, and he was the one who was the last Prophet of Allah, and we are his successors. In this way, he's demonstrating and teaching us what the characteristics should be and how to behave. To the extent we have a book that is known as Uyun Akhbar ar the source of narrations, the source of information from ar that he is compiled by Sheikh Suduk that includes all of the various debates and lectures and discussions that were taught by our eighth Imam in how to behave and how that we should act as mu'mineen and what are the information that he wanted to teach us. In one other example, what was famous at that time was poetry. And there used to be a poet known by, known by the name as, of Da'ab al-Khuzai. Da'ab al-Khuzai was a famous poet who used to love the Ahlul Bayt. And one day he prepared this beautiful piece of poetry about Imam Hussein. And this piece of poetry is still very famous today and it's still recited in Arabic very often. And Da'ab, when he prepared this piece of poetry, he went to our eighth Imam and he says, I want to recite poetry for you. So Imam Radha says, okay, recite poetry for me. As Da'ab begins to recite this poetry, there are two things that, one that I want you to remember and one we'll continue the conversation on. The first thing is, as he gets to a point in this piece of poetry, Imam Radha falls down. So Da'ab stops. Imam Radha says, continue, continue, recite the poetry again. So Da'ab begins again and he recites the poetry. When he gets to that same light in his, line in his poetry, Imam Radha falls down again. So Da'ab stops again. Imam Radha says, no, no, I want you to recite the poem. And the third time when Imam Radha, he gets to that line, Imam Radha is very grief-stricken, but he continues and he finishes the poetry. Imam Radha says, after this poetry... I'll add on to your poem in my own words. And Imam Radha talks about his own shahadat that's coming to be. He says, Da'ab, I have told you these lines, but don't ever share them with anyone. And then he says, Da'ab, I want to give you a reward for what you've done for me. So at that time, Ma'moon had printed these coins, these dirhams, that had the name of Imam Radha written on them. So Imam Radha takes 100 coins and he gives it to Da'ab al khuzai Da'ab says, Imam Radha, I don't want this money, I don't need money. Imam Radha says, no, I want to give this to you as a gift, keep it close to you, it will come in handy. Da'ab says, okay, but Yabna Rasulullah, I want a reward from you, I want a shirt from you that I get to keep and I want to be buried in that shirt, I want to be buried in your shirt. So Imam Radha says, if this is the reward you want for the poetry you wrote for us, no problem, I'll give you. When Da'ab al Khuzai takes this reward, Ma'moon hears that a poet has come to Al Radha and has recited poetry for the eighth Imam that is so good that Imam Radha was really surprised by it and really loved it. So Ma'moon calls Da'ab al Khuzai to the Darbar, to his court, and he says, Da'ab, recite poetry for me. So Da'ab recites this poem, that poem, the other poem. He says, No, this isn't the poem I want to hear. Da'ab says, Which poem do you want to hear? He says, I want to hear that special poem you recited for Al Radha. He says, first he tries to say, I don't want to, I don't know. But Imam Radha is sitting in the court and Imam Radha says, you have my permission to recite the poem. Da'ab al-Khuzai recites the poem about Imam Hussein for Ma'moon. Ma'moon listening to this poem and the beauty of this poetry says, wow, that was beautiful. And he gives Da'ab al-Khuzai a brand new horse, a beautiful horse, and thousands upon thousands of coins of that time. And Da'ab al-Khuzai takes all of this and he leaves. 
So he says, thank you very much, and he heads back to his town, and he joins a caravan, and the caravan, as it's traveling, looters, they come, and they loot the caravan. When they loot the caravan, they take all of the thousands of coins that were given by Ma'mun, and they take his horse. As the chief of the looters takes the horse away, he sits on the horse and starts reciting Da'ab al khuzais poetry. The same poem he just recited for Imam Rada. So Da'ab al khuzai says to the thief, he says, Oh thief, whose poem are you reciting? He says, you wouldn't know. He says, tell me whose poem is this? He says, this is the poem that Da'ab al khuzai recited in the Darbar. This is that poem. You wouldn't know about it. Da'ab al khuzai replies, he says, I am Da'ab al khuzai That was my poem. I recited that poem. So the looter says, oh, you recited that poem. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Here's all your things back. They gave him all of his things and Da'ab al khuzai continued on the way. When he continues on his way, he gets to the city of Qum. The city of Qum had some people who used to love the Ahlul Bayt. Those people, when they see Da'ab al khuzai they see that Da'ab al khuzai has a shirt from Imam Rada. And they say, Da'ab, give us this shirt. Da'ab says, no, this is my shirt. I'm going to be buried in it. How can I give it to you? They say, no, no, give it to us, give it to us, give it to us. He insists and he says, no. They say, sell us a piece of this shirt. He says, I will not. So they become very upset. And this is the difference. This is where the characteristics come different. That you have to pay attention. If you want to love the Ahlul Bayt, you have to behave in an appropriate fashion. When Da'ab leaves and he refuses to give them that shirt, that night the people of Qum, they come, they beat him up, they loot him, and they steal that shirt from him. Meaning what? How could they really love Imam Rada if they were willing to beat this man and steal from him out of the love of the Imam? The same way you and I, when we possess and profess the love of the Ahlul Bayt, we have to act according to the way that they would want. The next morning, Da'ab comes back into town and he says, someone stole my shirt. They said, we don't know. He says, I'm willing to give all of the wealth I have for that shirt back. Remember, Ma'mun gave him a lot of wealth. They say, no. He says, fine, I'll give you all of my wealth for just a piece of that shirt. So someone says, okay, fine, put all your wealth over here. We'll leave the piece of a shirt for you. So Da'ab al khuzai trades all of his wealth for this one piece of shirt. And he heads back to his house. When he gets back to his town, his hometown, he finds out that someone came and looted his whole house and took away all of his money. They left him with nothing. He has not one thing left in his house. At that moment, he remembers, he says, Oh yeah, I only, the only wealth I have left is those 100 coins that Imam Rada gave me. And when I told Imam Rada, I don't want these coins, he says, Dab, hold on to these, these will come in handy one day. So he pulls them out. When he pulls them out, he goes into the marketplace and he says, I have official coins that have the name of Imam Rada written on them. I am willing to sell them to anyone who is willing to buy them. Da'ab al khuzai says, there was such barakat in the gift that Imam told me to keep. I sold each one of those coins for 10,000 coins. So he says, where I had nothing, by the barakat of the Imam, I now all of a sudden had 1 million coins. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. In this way, he demonstrates and he shows that sincerity and that love for the Holy Prophet and love for the Ahlul Bayt. And the Imam helps him and supports him and shows that sincerity of the Imam. But when we take a look at this piece of poetry and we look at this information, we go back and Da'ab says, he says, when I was sitting and I was reciting this poem for Imam Rada, I remember that at that moment that he would fall down. So someone asked him, Da'ab, why did Imam Rada fall down when you would recite that poem? He says, every time I would get to the point, point in reciting in my poetry that if Fatima saw Hussein lying on the battlefield of Karbala, she would strike her face. As soon as I would say this statement, Imam Rada would fall down. And then he would tell me to recite the poetry again and again I would recite it again and when I would get to the line that said, if Fatima saw the condition of Hussein lying in the field of Karbala, she would hit her face. When I finished my poem, I turned to Imam Rada and I said, Yabna Rasulullah, why is it that whenever I recite this line of poetry, you would fall to the ground? He says, Da'ab, you don't understand. Anytime you would say this line, I would see my mother Zahra striking her face before me looking in sadness upon the condition of Hussein ibn Ali alayhi salam. Imam Rada was one who used to teach us about the importance of Imam Hussein and the visiting of Imam Hussein. Imam Rada loved Imam Hussein so much 
that when he was about to die and Ma'mun had poisoned Imam Radha, Imam Radha turned to his companions and said, when I am about to die, I want you to leave me here alone in this room, but I want you to do me one favor before you leave me in this room alone. They said, Ya Rasulullah, you are in pain, it's the end of your life, whatever you say we will do for you. Imam Radha replies, he says, remove the carpets from my house, leave me on the dirt on the floor, on the floor in my house. They said to Imam Radha, Imam Radha, you're in pain, there's so much pain, why should we take you off of the bed and put you on the floor? Imam Radha he replies, he says, if but for a moment I want to feel how my grandfather Hussein ibn Ali felt. It was my grandfather Hussein ibn Ali who was left alone on the dirt of Karbala. And when I leave this world, I want to leave on the dirt the way my grandfather Hussein ibn Ali left. Imam Radha, with all due respect, when you left this world, your companions were around you. They were listening to your requests. But hi, was that Hussein ibn Ali in Karbala? That yes, he died on the ground. But instead of being surrounded by his companions and his friends, he was surrounded by the Mal'oonin. When you were poisoned, it was Hussein ibn Ali upon whose chest chest sat shimr. You may have been on the ground like Hussein ibn Ali, but Imam Radha, there was no one on your chest like there was on the chest of Hussein ibn Ali. على لعنة الله على القوم الظالمين وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي من قلم ينقلبون. Oh Allah, we ask you by the right of this majlis, by the right of the hadirin, make us from the true supporters of the Ahlul Bayt alayhi musalam. Oh Allah, there are those who have come with hajat, fulfill their hajat. There are those who are in need, fulfill their needs. There are those who are ill, remove their illness. Oh Allah, we ask you to hasten the reappearance of Sahib al-Zaman. And make us from the true supporters of Sahib al Zaman. Rahimullahu man yakra suratul fatiha ma'as salawat. Oh, ma'as salawat.